That's great. Um, so, I, actually, I'm really glad she mentioned you know that there are different groups of students in the class too, and uh, everyone. I think who's been helping with this uh, program here today uh, tend to be the students who have won scholarships, you know, Heidi and um, Tegan and Joey and Philip and so on. Um, they're our students who are just, you know, really into it in a big way, and that's why they're still here over the summer and doing stuff in there. But there is a group of students um, who will do well, uh, and dare I say, one or two of them were speaking last night at the Educutra um, thing as well, who, you know, weren't absolute top students, but boy, could they organise things. Um, and one in particular had half of his third year class working for him uh, during this third year. <laughs> so, um, with a small business on the side, and, and, it, and it, everyone was happy. And, uh, <laughs> except the lecturers, one of the assignments done this year. Um, but, and, and in fact, one of the things we say here is that we actually hope we're not just producing employees, um, but we're actually going to produce employers. Uh, and you know, most of the people speaking last night are employers who uh, hire 10, 20, 30, 100 people. Uh, and, and so they're the people who've got the innovation, the spark, that, that extra bit of business sense, the ability to communicate, the ability to get people to do things for them and reward them for it and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, but then there is you know, a large group of people that get the job done and know what they're doing and so on as well. So there's, there's kind of you know, lot roles for all kinds of people. And, uh, um, of course, when universities have their bring out students, they always bring out their star students who are doing incredibly well. Uh, and, uh, but, but if you want to know the secrets of that, how, how to produce people like Tegan, I guess um, Bill has got all the clues there. So, uh, um, right. Now, uh, we're up to level two today. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> um, just a quick show of hands, how many people are thinking of teaching? Uh, so right now I'm going to look at the 2.44 standard, otherwise known as AS91371. Yeah, I'm happy to be doing that. Okay. Um, and as we've sort of talked about a wee bit already, it can be kind of mixed in with other courses, you know, um, certainly obviously with programming, um, and I'll be showing ways that you can teach this mixed in with programming a wee bit. Um, but also with things like, in fact it came up in the discussion yesterday with media, um, you know, some of the, the graphing of results and portfolios and all that sort of stuff with the information systems and so on, um, there's a lot of overlap and someone was pointing out that you could probably hand in a, a really good report on a whole lot of experiments that was actually, um, you know, a good example of an information document. Uh, what's, what's the right Digital phrase? Information. Sorry, Digital information. Thank you. Um, as well as the content of it being a good example of computer science. Um, it would be putting two eggs in one basket, but, um, you know, on the other hand, it, be nice for everyone concerned to have a document that's you know well prepared and got good content in it. So um, there's lots of ways to mix these things up, um, and a lot of the stuff we're going to look at today. Um, so, for example, looking at a compression, the stuff that we compress is typically music and photographs and things like that. Uh, and so again, people can record their own stuff, make their own videos, make their own photographs, manipulate them, and so on. But then also look at how they're stored. And that's the computer science side of it, but it, and, and, and it, you end up with this big continuum. So if you're into the media thing, then that's a possibility. Um, not so much with computer science, but well, yes, with um, you know, web development, obviously security and encryption is, is a big deal if you're doing some kinds of uh, web sites and so on. Uh, and so that might be combined with that. And of course, programming can often be <coughs> combined with web development and so on. So there's lots of room to uh, mix these things together. Oh, another one, <coughs> electronics and programming. Uh, and then, in fact, today at lunchtime, we've got um, Hanno Sandler, who's developed the T-Bot. Some of you might have seen this. It's um, a, sort, of, sort of another robot that's useful for teaching. Uh, and he's got a language uh, for it called 12 Blocks, which I noticed at least one person here is using, I think. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, and one of my students last year developed a project where you can actually do some of the encoding stuff using a T-Bot. Um, and, uh, so I think most of you have got the parity trick sorted out. Um, thank you, Heidi. And so um, he, what they developed last year is a way to get the T-Bot to do the parity trick. <laughs> so you put the cards on the floor, you flip one over, and it whizzes around and figures out which one's been flipped over. 
Uh, and of course that ticks about 20 boxes in one go in terms of activities and so on. So it's a completely different angle on the thing. Uh, and yet it's this robot doing magic, you know, it's sort of standing off to one side, flip a card over and it whizzes around and goes, and that, that's the one you um, So, lots of ways to combine this. Um, but what I'm going to do is, um, again, fairly quickly, this is worth four credits, uh, the, the standard. So we're going to do four credits in about one hour. Uh, <laughs> And um, again, the pace is quite hard, uh, but hopefully you can, um, get, well, obviously you will unpack this for your students and do it at a gentler pace and, and a lot of things I'll just sort of say, here's a good idea, but I won't go into detail on it. Um, so three parts of the standard, representing data using bits, um, encoding the data, uh, and then the usability. Uh, actually, I, I won't do a whole lot of that. If we get time, we might do a little bit more of usability analysis, but essentially what Andy was talking about yesterday nails that standard um, and there's stuff in the exemplar online and, and if you've got Nielsen's heuristics and you've got kids with a relatively open mind about looking at interfaces and being prepared to look step by step at things then, then I think we've got that one sorted. Um, so I'll focus a bit more on the other two and, and there are three kinds of encoding to look at so that can take a while. So representing data using bits, um, the, the very first step of that is binary numbers, and these things just keep on coming up everywhere around computers, computer science, and so on. Um, now, just a quick show of hands, how many people are, are comfortable with binary numbers? Right, so, okay. A lot, but not all. Good. Um, so, some of you have picked up these binary pianos, which um, oh, Max has very kindly cut some up for us, so if you want to pass those around. Um, just, just one each for these, but we've, we've got enough of them. But we have got enough here for the class set, you know, 30 or 40 each, I think, roughly, um, that you're welcome to take. Um, they're also up on the insect dit site, uh, so under the level 2 material, um, you'll, you'll just see a binary panel. And if you print it out double sided, it should, should just work out. Um, but uh, there should be enough copies there for you. They're kind of semi-disposable, I guess, anyway. Um, so, the instructions are fold them in half, like that. And then you've got all the ones at the top. And we're going to make binary numbers. The, for a start, we want to just fold up all the, the keys on the thing so that you've got all zeros showing. Get any class to do that, you might want to get them to do the fold before they do the cut. Yeah. And this is just a little binary number calculator. So <laughs> it's not enough. Who's holding out? Who's got one? Oh, We won't spend too long on this anyway. Okay, so the way it works. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So, well, actually, the, so the key concept here is. Oh, there you go. They're away over here. The key concept is everything on a computer is stored using zeros and ones. And I, th I think that when I ask students about that, normally they're aware of that concept that there's nothing but zeros and ones on a computer. But it kind of stops there, and then there's this disconnect. And there are files, you know, Word documents and web pages and downloads and MP3 files. But the reality is that every single file, any data whatsoever, is just a whole lot of zeros and ones. And so um, this part of the standard really is just connecting up those two ideas that if you've got nothing but zeros and ones, how would you represent things? And so the piano here um, essentially shows us how to represent numbers. And the um, so, so if we let's just do a binary number, um, if we've got one zero one on the right hand side, then that's just a four and a one. Okay, so each position here is worth starting at the right hand side is worth twice as much as the previous one. So, so if you fold it so that it um, so it says one zero one in the, in the big numbers, then down the bottom we've got zero plus zero plus zero plus four plus zero plus one. So that represents the number five. Okay, now if I was doing this with a class. Um, actually, one, one way of doing this would be, um, so let's try and represent the number 21, okay? Um, if, you, if you look at all the numbers, are you going to want the 256? No. 
128? No. 64? 32? Okay. Doing the number 21. Um, do you want the 16? Yes. Yes. Okay. Do you want the 8? No. No. So that folds up. Do you want the 4? Yes. Do you want the 0? No. no. And do you want the 1? Yes. yes. Okay. And we've got 16, 4 and 1. And so the number 21 is represented using 10101. Now, the question is, is there another way to get the number 21? No. No. Okay. And you can work through that, but you can say, well, let's think about it. You know, could I use any of the things bigger than the 16? No, that would be too big. Um, what if I don't have the 16? What's the problem if I don't have the 16? Yeah, there's only 15 numbers, you know, the total is only 15 left, so there's no way I'll get up to 21, so I have to have the 16. And you can reason through it that you have to have each, you know, each decision that you just gave me. The other point is that when I was asking you questions, you said yes, no, yes, no, yes to me. And you actually were communicating a number to me just using two values, yes and no. And in fact, binary numbers on computers, of course, aren't stored using actual zeros and ones. Um, and you can talk about how they're stored on a CD. Um, but yet, I, normally students can figure this out. So, um, but most of them, I find, haven't thought it, thought it through, but um, they know why you shouldn't look inside a CD player, because there's a warning on it. Okay, so, and so, what's their answer going to be? Why don't you look inside? There's a laser in there. And what could the laser be doing? Oh, maybe it's shining on the thing. And, and they'll generally come up with the idea that maybe there's dark and light spots, and one or two of them might know that there's pits and, and whatnot on the, on the surface of the disk. But just the idea that it shines onto it and it either reflects off or doesn't reflect off, and you've got zeros and ones. And, and, and the whole point of this is that when you're storing stuff, it's much easier just to say it does reflect or it doesn't reflect. Just having two values um, on a, a um, magnetic disk, on a hard disk, or on a floppy disk, if anyone has still got one, um, it's magnetic. And the magnet's got two ends, north and south, and it's just which way it's magnetized is whether or not it's a zero or one. So, but using just those two digits, um, we can actually make up larger numbers. And, and then there's also, I mean, you've probably, some of you have got all sorts of ways of teaching binary numbers and things. And, and um, another, another exercise I find quite helpful is to do counting. So first thing I will ask is, what's the smallest number we can represent? And the, the students would say, one. one. And then you wait for about two seconds and then someone will call out zero, with everything folded up. Um, and, and, and then get them to count. So we've got zero. Um, one, obviously just fold down the first one. Two, you have to fold up the first one and fold up the fold down the next one. Three, and after a while I realise that that very right hand one, how often does that have to be folded up and down? Every time. Every time. And what's special about the ones where it's folded down? That, yeah, well, it, well sorry, when, when it's got the plus one, it's always an odd number because all the others are even numbers and so on. So, so you can tell instantly if something's an odd number just by whether it's got a one on the right hand side, for example. Um, another thing, oh, oh, one thing I should mention with the standard is that um, Heidi's put together, is putting together a lesson plan for this thing, um, which we've, we'll, we'll, we'll release when it's done, but I've got a, a sneak preview of it here. Uh, so, so it's, it's moderately detailed and it's, it's got a lot of these sort of things in it here. So, um, oh, so here's a good question. If you had the 11th card and the 11th key on this piano, what would be the number on it? So it's got 10 keys at the moment, 256. Yeah. Um, so, you know, get the students to think about the pattern, actually. Oh, there's nine. Okay. Right. It's good. You can see there's a work in progress. This is why Heidi's making notes today. Um, so, the... Um, uh, you know, what's the smallest number, what's the largest number, all that, all that sort of thing. Um, you can see notes on, we're still working on it. And the, one of the interesting ones is doubling a number. So, so put a number up here, let's put up 21, which was what, 10101. Now, if you want to double the number 21, it, they, one way of doing it is, of course, you convert it to decimal numbers, it's 42, and then work out 42. But if, if you get them to double a couple of numbers, they'll soon realise that there's a pattern here. Um, so someone, yeah, move everything one to the left. So if you've got 10101, 
Well, you just put a, an extra zero on the right. Yeah, so one, zero, one, zero, one, and add a zero on it. In the same way that when we multiply by 10, normally you just put a zero on the right hand side to multiply by 10. In base 2, multiplying by 2, you just put a zero on the right hand side. Um, and, and what I've found is students generally figure this out pretty quickly if you get them to do a couple of examples of doubling and they start to realize, oh, of course, you know, each number to the left is twice the number. Uh, and, and so if I move everything to the left, then it's, it's going to double the value and halving if you move in the other direction and so on. Um, and remember, again, the standard is an understanding of how binary representation works. So how are they going to demonstrate this understanding? Um, in a personal sort of way, again, don't copy a Wikipedia definition of binary and reword it, but, you know, have them say, well, you know, here, my birthday is the 25th, so I put down the number 25, and I noticed when you double it, you can do it by moving everything left 50, and suddenly it, it's clearly the student's work. It's suspicious of everyone in the class that their birthday is the 25th or something like that. Um, but, the, you know, there's... That there's hundreds of numbers for them to choose from, so you know, choose a number, write about it, um, find a pattern and write about it, um, do a sequence of numbers and talk about the pattern that's there, um, but just don't do the same one that everyone else uses, and, and suddenly you've got very authentic student work that reflects an experience that they've had working with those numbers. This is one way of doing it, another way that um, uh, we've done it with the Unplugged program is with um, buying cards, and okay, talk a bit about unplugged. I might just um, on the website um, for unplugged, see us unplugged at all. Um, this is called Count the Dots, and we just get a kid to um, this again was that aimed at primary school sort of age, but um, so they get five cards, and again, you know, I give out one dot, sometimes get five kids up the front like that, each one holding a card. Um, First one gets one, the next one gets a two, you ask them, you know, what's the next one going to be? And they'll say three. three. And usually I just silently give them a four and everyone goes, no, no, you got it wrong, what, what, what? And, and then, you know, what's the next one going to be? And the answer would typically be six. Six, yeah. One, two, four, six, obvious sequence. And you give out an A's and there's usually a little bit more discussion and so on. And then suddenly everyone knows exactly what it is and they're yelling out all the numbers up to 1,024 or whatever. Uh, again, you know, that, that, that they've figured that out. Um, another question is, you know, like, what's the biggest number we can represent? And one of the patterns that they'll find with the, um, when they're counting is that when you get a whole lot of ones in a row, like that, so that number there, 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1 is 15, but the next number is always going to be just that, that, yeah, that digit there. It's sort of rolling over. It's the equivalent of going from 999 and adding 1, and everything rolls over to 0 when you go to bring in another digit. Um, and again, you know, let them experience that pattern a few times. They'll, um, generally I find that they start to, to see it quite clearly so that then, if we say, well, what if they're all ones? I mean, some of them will just add up all the digits and all the numbers and that's okay. But some will realize that that will be one less than whatever the next one would have been. And they've already told us what the next one would have been. So therefore, those numbers all add up to? 511. And Again, you know, they're, they're starting to get their head around all these patterns. Um, well, and, and another very important pattern here is that if we do add one more bit, then instead of going up to 511 as we can with 9 bits, with 10 bits we can go up to 1,023, right? 1,024 less 1, yeah. Um, how many different values are there? Well, it goes from 0 to 1,023, so how many values can we represent? 1024. So there's a subtle difference between what's the biggest number and how many different values can we represent. Um, the, this website, there's, there's, there's heaps of um, links on here as well. Um, and, and all of these ones, Simon's transferred over to the NZ DIT site. But that, um, I think everyone writes an article about binary numbers. Uh, so it just, <laughs> just goes on and on. Binary digital clocks, um, binary math worksheet. Um, and so on. Um, there's a couple of fun ones like um, counting on fingers. Anyone count binary on fingers? Each finger is up or down? Yeah. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, it's just doing the number four, sir. That's, you know. um, so, quick question, you know, what's that number? 
31? Okay, someone's on Twitter, yeah. Because. I do this one now, maybe from the neighborhood goes down. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I've had a lot of practice for this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what's that number? <laughs> yeah, 1023, someone's got it already. Now, um, you know, again, it's 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus, you know, you could work it out that way. Or that one there is 512, so therefore double that and subtract 1, and you've got, so you can count up to over 1,000. On your fingers, which is fun, and there's videos of people doing that, and some of your sister doing it, and stuff like that. Um, so, hundreds of ways of, of bringing up the idea of um, binary numbers. Um, sometimes, uh, the, great. When I do the binary numbers, at the start of the lesson, I say, I'm going to tell you a joke that no one's going to get, and as we go through the lesson, you'll slowly start getting it, and I'm rather bored. There are ten types of people in the world. Those who are one and those who don't. I'm starting to suddenly get a giggle from the back of the class. And I've got it. And then the rest of the class is really focused because now there's a joke that they're not into. You know, right. you know, the people start laughing and they're like, oh, you can see them. The other's getting really worked up because now the whole class knows the joke apart from them. Right. Which actually reminds me, another really good joke. Um, and I, been reminded that I haven't introduced Arnold, who I don't use with high schoolers so much, but we, we do a lot of the stuff with primary school kids we've been doing it for years, and um, I, I don't know if that's a good line to use if you you know, that this has been taught in primary school kids for years, but now we're going to do it for year 11s, but anyway, um, <laughs> the, yeah, so one of the things on the show is that, um, oh, in fact, Matt was one of the jesters last night, so he was a student here, and he used to run the show, and he brought along this parrot, um, because we were doing Capriti, which you, you know, kind of <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Anyway, you know, we do the survey at the end of the show, you know, what did you like the most, you know, Tim, Matt, Arnold, whatever, and it was always Arnold, right, the wonder parrot, Arnold the wonder parrot, and so Arnold's in a permanent place in the unplugged, and he's the mascot of unplugged. Um, but here, here's a good question uh, you can ask in class too, what do you call this? Pieces of nine, pieces of nine. A parrot era. A parrot era, yes. <laughs> That's sad, isn't it? <laughs> um, just a quick couple of um, Some of you may have come across this magic trick using binary numbers. No? Okay, so someone think of the number. Max, think of a number. Between one and. Big number, 60 ish. Okay. okay. Um, is it on the yellow card? No. R red? No. <coughs> Blue? Yeah. Green? No. Black? No. Good. No. No? So it's 32. Maybe it is on one of those cards. Maybe it's on this card. Yeah, so green. not in order. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry, it's on the yellow one as well. Okay, so it's on yellow and blue? It's on yellow and blue. So it's 40. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, you know, quite, quite handy from print. So normally, you know, just print out these cards and these links there that have got them. Um, basically, these are all the numbers here in which the right-hand bit is a 1. In other words, just the odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7, right? These are all the numbers in which the right-hand, uh, the second right-hand bit is a 1. Okay, so 2 and 3, the second right-hand bit is a 1. Um, and so, when Max said yes or no, or what, whatever cards it's on, he was just saying basically the 8 bit is set, the 2 bit is, well, in fact, what he said to me is the 8 bit is on and the 32 bit is on. Um, and so he just had those two numbers together, and, and the first number on each card. Yeah. So if he said it was on the black and purple, then the number would have been 5. Okay. Uh, now, that, that's a fun introduction, but then the challenge for your students is okay, I'm going to take that off the board, you write down what should be on the cards. Okay. And suddenly there's a motivation to make a list of all the numbers in which, you know, the, the third bit is a one. Um, actually, and that would be a good programming exercise or a good spreadsheet exercise too. Um, so, I, um, I generalise that to us. Um, th this is for binary. Um, I've got a base six version. I might bring it down if something reminds me. Um, it's a six-sided <laughs> dice. And, I can actually roll three dice, they've got all sorts of numbers on them, and you can just look at these three, add up the first number on each one and say the number 121 is on all three of those dice, and the kids are looking at it going, 
I don't know. Oh, you're right. Yes, it is. You know, and so you can sort of instantly see which numbers on all of them. So it's another way of doing it. You know, shuffle them, pick a couple of random, and say the number such and such is on these two, but not on the others. Um, okay. And there's a thousand other ways to do binary numbers with bits there. Um, what I can do from that is, though, so, so that the standard says talking about storing numbers and text. Oh, but sorry, one, one of the, the big questions with this is what's the biggest number you can store? A um, couple of definitions. Um, so, and, and one is just the idea that, um, I normally draw this out with kids, the idea that it, each of those zeros and ones is a binary digit. And, you know, what's, what's the short name for a binary digit? Um, take the first two and the last two letters, okay. Um, the, and, and then the group of eight of them, um, which is called a byte, okay. Uh, so, and something makes sense, you know, if, you, if you've got, a, there's a group of six of them, uh, I had groups of five before, you've got a group of nine to, on here, but if, if you were to just throw away the last key on this, which you could do, rip it off or whatever, um, that would be one byte, eight bits. And so what's the biggest number we can do with one byte? Well, actually, the last key tells you, basically, 255, and the smallest number is zero. So one byte has got the numbers from zero, one, well, 256 values. What if I go to two bytes? You know, what's the biggest number we can do? And is it, you know, twice as many bits as the number twice as big? No, okay. It's actually 256 times as big, um, because every bit we add, it's twice as many. So if I had two bytes, I can actually represent numbers up to... 655335, five, five, actually, if you really want to know. But your students can work that out You just by getting a spreadsheet, you know. Um, in fact, it's almost the reverse of what we were doing yesterday. Uh, so here's my spreadsheet from yesterday, but this time I'm going to put in the number one, and so at the top, number one, and then this value is equal to that value times two. Um, Down. So by the time it's just a Mac user on a Windows machine too, it's, uh, just to add to your entertainment value. So here we go. Um, you know, the 8th bit is worth 128. Um, or in fact, if I put the number 2 in there, this would correspond with a letter. So that the, if with one bit, I've got two different values. Two bits, I've got four, and so on. Um, but, so 8 is the 256 for one byte, but 16, 65536. Okay. Um, it's sad, but a lot of computer scientists know that number off by heart. Because, <laughs> well, if we go back to our binary search, 65536, if I were to do a binary search of 65,000 items, it would take me um, roughly um, 16 lots of dividing it in half. Okay? Um, and and you, this binary relationship keeps coming up. You remember with quicksort, you know, I said divide it into two parts and then deal with each of those. And again, this binary thing, when you analyze quicksort, which even our first year students don't do, it's a bit fiddly, um, but when you analyze it, this relationship comes up. It, it, um, Later on in some of our more advanced data structures that they do here, we have binary trees, binary heaps, and so on. Um, binary just it comes up and all the time. These numbers are really important um, in working out uh, things to do with algorithms, data structures, and so on. So it's well worth being familiar with them. But the really key thing here is that if I go to 16 bits, I can represent 65,000 different things. And so one of the places that comes up is representing the characters of the alphabet. Um, so the normal code that's used. Um, and students have probably seen it. Actually, not relatively few that I've talked to seem to have heard of it, but um, ASCII code, uh, American standard code for information engineering, um, uses 8 bits, and so you can't have more than 256 different characters, and in fact, it only uses 7 of them, so how many is that? You know, there's lots of questions for your students to think about there. Um, and why would you even need, you know, it's only 26 characters of the alphabet, why do you need more than 26? Um, and get them to think about those sort of issues. But why would you need more than 256 characters? Asian languages. And so how many characters are there in Chinese? And 
some of your students might have a rough idea, they might be studying Chinese or know a bit of Chinese, but there's, there's thousands. I think everyday vocabulary is in the order of 5,000 or something like that. Uh, and so with two bytes, 65,000 characters is enough to represent Chinese characters. Uh, and so the interesting thing is, although there's thousand times as many characters, sort of, um, we only need twice as many bits to represent it. And that's, that's a really powerful idea, and this is the stuff that computer scientists love, is that when problems get thousand times bigger, and it only takes a little bit more effort to do it. Okay. And that's, uh, to me, there's a few things in computer science culture that, that people kind of adopt, and one is this idea that you really like it when you've created a situation for yourself where something that gets much, much bigger costs only a little bit more. Okay. Searching a million times as many things only takes a few more steps. Um, representing a million times more things only takes a few more bits. Um, it also works the other way with encryption, so you have keys for encryption, uh, and those of you who have set up websites and uh, websites, wireless connections and so on, be aware that you know, do you want to use a 128-bit key or a 200-bit key and things like that. How, if I wanted to try out all of your possible keys, and it was say an 8-bit key, which no one uses, how many thing, how many keys would I have to try out? 256 different ones, and I could write a program that just tried them all and would take a tiny amount of time. If you went up to a 16-bit key, is that twice as hard to crack? No, I have to try out 65,000 different keys on your, you know, to crack into your wireless system, um, which is actually still relatively insecure. Actually, I'm sort of jumping onto the security thing now too. Um, but, and, 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 and basically the difference between say a 128-bit key and a 200-bit key, the 200-bit key isn't almost twice as good. It is billions of times better. Uh, and, and that's what you get, because every time your key is one bit larger, your attacker has got twice as many things to try out. Um, and again, you know, just that concept where adding one more makes it twice as good. The test code comes up in um, HTML as well, as in the head of the HTML, we teach the kids to use it, like which text encoding are they going to use. And oh, okay, yep. To do UTF-8 or something like that. Right. It's in the head of that, so there's a good crossover there with media. Uh, remember we did how you convert codes and now there's a standard for it. Oh, that's, 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 that's cool actually, yeah, you can look out for it. So, you, so the 8 in UTF-8 means 8 bits. Yeah. Um, and, and also you've got things like 16-bit um, audio, you know, so CDs for 16-bit audio. So how many different levels <coughs> of audio are possible with 16 bits? 65,000. The recording studio would use 24-bit audio for, 24-bit uh, recording for high quality. How, you know, how much better is that? Not a half as much better again, it's actually 256 times more accurate for recording the audio sound. Um, colour, you might have 16 bit colour or 24 bit colour. You know, how many different colours can that represent? Uh, so 16 bit, well, 24 bit colour can represent, um, quite got there. it's just over a million, anyway. it's a couple of million, isn't it? 16 million? Okay, so 16 million. And again, just get your students to work it out from first principle. No one wants to be told 24 bit color for everything 16 million, but go work it out for yourself. Um, and how many different colors can the human eye perceive? It's, it's around the million mark. Okay, so now suddenly, we've, if, if you've got 16 bit color with 65,000 colors, the human eye can probably tell the difference between all of, all of those under very, very good conditions. Um, whereas if you go to 24-bit colour, it's beyond the capacity of the human eye to distinguish two of those colours. It's the female eye. The male eye can only see eight colours, right? So, but, <laughs> <laughs> there's these apricots and things that are named after animals. And things. Um, <laughs> now, generally when, when I'm uh, doing codes, I actually start off with this one here. In fact, I get the students to invent this for themselves. So. Um, which they very readily come, you know, if all I can do is give you a number from 1 to 31, which is what we were doing with five bits on a finger, for example, how would you represent texts? And I'll generally come up with this, except for one kid who, he said, oh, I know, um, you could have like 1 is D, and 2 is Z, and 3 is J, and so on. Um, but everyone else in the class shouted them down really quickly. <laughs> the simple system here. Um, and so now, and the other thing that we've done a bit of is, um, and this is kind of, you know, another angle of attack, is representing these things using a modem, uh, which is still being used, although they're kind of a bit more hidden these days. Um, 
and sometimes they talk about how a modem, there's two parts to it. it, it, it I don't use the word modem until I've done this with them. So it modulates the zeros and ones into sound. Um, so a zero I'm going to use as a low beep, beep, and a one as a high beep, beep. Okay. And uh, the and at the other end something will listen to those beeps and convert them, and that's called the demodulator. And once again, we just need to abbreviate that to make it a little bit shorter. And generally the students go, ah, oh, I'm going to see it. And, uh, which is all a modem is, it converts these things to zeros and ones. Um, so we can uh, send messages um, just using beeps. I'll, I'll send you a letter with your binary pianos ready. It's just going to have five, um, five digits in it. And it's, it goes like this. Um, beep, 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 beep. Okay. Now if you're only using five, it's the right hand five, and that's an important concept. It's implied that everything else on the left is zeros. You want to figure out what the number was for a start? Yeah. 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 It sounds so fast. Yeah, it's an H, yeah. B, 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 B. Yeah, you can do it slower because you want. You're and assuming you're seeing the highest at first. Yeah. Yes, now that's, and, and these are the things to discuss, right? Now, so normally that's the convention, you know, if you give a number you'd say 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, and so on. But, not all the time, and that's something that has to be decided, and all those sort of things. And, 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 and again, as a computer scientist, we're not so much interested in saying this is how it's done, but you know, what are the options? Why would we do it? Oh, we need to have a convention, we need to agree on you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, um, this is going to be a bit of, bit of a diversion. But, um, just trying to remember where it is now. Um, The, I'll just go straight to the video, I think. Um, we, we've got a, a couple of recordings online of um, a singer doing this. Some, who, who's heard our singer? Yeah, okay. Um, and that's how to find things when you've got people seven at night. Um, again, these are, these are all available from both the Unplugged site and, and indirectly through the Insectit site. Oops. <coughs> it's my wife's band.
So what she, here's the tune that she's singing is like the other one. It's got low and high notes. You can sit down and write down 0011, 0011 for low and high notes. And it, it's got a little congratulatory message when you decode it. And it then tells you which other part to go and look in to get the next part of the message. Um, and so there's messages in the drums, there's messages in the bass, there's messages in the horn parts. Um, there's, in the background, you notice sometimes she's got a black and white flashing background. Um, at times, um, she's dancing, one, zero, zero, one, and so on. Um, but it's on YouTube, it's called Reaching Out. Uh, oh, it's on your clip drive as well. Um, this is what, so this is one of the ones that you would show the kids. Uh, in fact, give it to them and just set it as a challenge. Yeah. So it's just purely low-high, it's no relationship to the interval? Uh, yes, that's right. So in every, every group of five, I mean, and again, this is a question you want your students to think about, um, you know, how would I have done it? But yeah, it's, it's basically, you take every group of five notes and the low ones will all be the same and the high ones will all be the same. And yeah, um, they may need a music student to help them out. If they really want to get serious with it, they'll need some media skills because they'll need to filter out bass parts and drum parts and just try and get those you know, emphasize those so that they can hear them as well. Or slow down the background so they can see what's happening. Um, there's a little ramp in the middle of it that explains how to do the decoding as well. Um, um, and one of the lines, you know, she sings about the point is that this method is called steganography, uh, which is actually a, a technique from encryption. Uh, has anyone come across steganography? Yeah, so the cool idea is you hide a message in something that looks like it's completely harmless. Um, and a common application would be if you're in, say, a country uh, where, with a regime that may not be, have a good human rights record, for example, and you want to get information out of that country through the internet, but you don't want the, the officials to know that you're spying, so you take a photograph of a you know, well-known site in your country and put a caption on it saying, what an amazing country this is, they have wonderful sites here, and so on. But the bits within the picture, just if they get altered in a way that doesn't really affect the picture, but someone can pull out those bits as zeros and ones and extract some text from it. Um, and so it's a, it's a technique for you know, hiding messages within other messages. This is, sorry? Uh, it's got uh, S-T-E-G, A-M, apography. Yeah. I think, the etymology of it is something that's to do with hair, actually, because um, in very ancient days they would write a message on a messenger's head, and the, the hair would grow back, and it wouldn't look like they had a message there, and you know they carry another message, but when they got there they shaved them to read what the real message was or something. Like that. So you could try that for fun with your students. <laughs> Um, <coughs> then, other stuff that's represented with um, numbers, uh, so what some of the exercises that we point to are for images, uh, oh, so black and white images in particular, there's worksheets there that you can download and get you know, students start working on just the idea that zero might be a white pixel and one this might be a black pixel, and putting, putting together images and so on. Um, so, Gallons of stuff on that, and some very cool stuff. Um, there's, there's heaps more that's just as cool as what I've shown you as well. Um, so you, you sport for choice there. Uh, but I want to move on to the second bullet point in the standard, which is encoding information uh, using compression, error control, and encryption. Uh, and again, this is sort of really fundamental to how things work on computers and digital devices. Because basically, if we didn't have MP3s, if we didn't have JPEGs, then things like um, iPods and digital cameras and so on would not function half as well as they do. You, you know, you take three photos and you have to go and unload your camera um, because the, the, everything's way too big to store. Um, <coughs> you know, choose your ten songs you're going to have with you for the day because that completely fills up your iPod and things like that. So, and, and, and the, the standard basically says what an understanding of why these things are important, and, and so the understanding will generally be along the lines of, well, my iPod or my MP3 player or my camera can hold a thousand photos. Um, if they weren't compressed using JPEG, if they used a different format, they would be 10 times or 20 or 100 times bigger, whatever it is, go and find out the number. And 
then um, and, and report on that. So I'll actually I'll just, I'll, I'm sure I was just doing an example the other day. Um, so this Python uh, program just likes to keep on jumping up. So this is iTunes, uh, but um, which is one way. It's quite a good way of converting between different. Uh, media formats. What, what other ones would you use for converting to MP3 and so on? WAV files in MP3 for ripple Audacity. CDs? Audacity, yeah. Anything else widely used? So both Audacity and iTunes uh, free download. They work on Windows and Mac. A lot of people think. Uh, actually, iTunes has also got a good interface um, uh, evaluation in it because it's a Mac product that runs on Windows, which is highly reminds me, it still looks like a Mac product on Windows. And remember, one of the guidelines was consistency. If it's a Windows machine being used by Windows people, it should have things where a Windows person would expect to find them. Um, and so even though it's a beautiful Mac product, <laughs> um, it, uh, it, it's wrong to have it inconsistent if you put it on a Windows environment. And, and so yeah, Windows people are allowed to say this software sucks, even though Mac people think it's just the coolest thing. It does actually have a few issues on Mac's even as well. But um, <laughs> what I've done here is I've, I've created a few files um, as, as WAV files. Actually. So, so I've got four WAV files. So um, this one down here is just a nice bit of art. Okay. Um, Each has got a size, so the si I've got 21 megabytes of silence here, and it's two minutes. So, which, in interestingly, you know, this this thing here is about five minutes long, and it's about 50 megabytes. So we're talking about roughly 10 megabytes a minute, which is how what a WAV file always uses. And so, again, you know, very personalised. Okay. Uh, in fact, for those of you who met Judith last night, most of those have been played by her, which is really nice. Um, but you know, my own playlist or um, you know my favourite songs or something like that. So again, there's no reason that any two kids in the country would hand in the same list of things that they've done this experiment on. Um, and particularly if they're doing media or music or something like that, grab their own songs or their own recordings, grab a recording thing and go and, you know, voice. What about voice? How much space does that take? And the answer is with a WAV file, always the same amount of space because every sample in it uses 16 bits, it does 44,000 samples every second, and there's the left and the right channel for stereo. And so from that, um, we, you know, you can predict exactly how big a wave file is going to be. Um, and there's, there's tons of information about that, and Heidi's linked to it in the notes and all that sort of thing anyway. But then the fun starts because what I've done, um, so in iTunes, you just, you have to set the preferences. In fact, I'll do that. Um, so one of the formats that you can use um, instead of, is um, the Apple lossless encoder here, which preserves the quality of the original file, but now when I go to convert this, uh, is the convert to? Uh, Apple lossless version? Ah. Ah, here we go, create Apple lossless version, yeah. Um, and so it converts it to whatever my setting is. That's been converted down to 21 megabytes, and, oh no, sorry, it was 21 megabytes, and okay. Isn't it the Apple lossless one? That one? No. Yeah, okay, 157k. Um, oh, by the way, the other thing, terminology you need to teach them is kilobyte and megabyte and so on too, which is, yeah. um, But here they're actually applying it, you know. That compressed version is 157, the original was 21, so it was a bigger, you know, 157 bigger than 21, which some students will report in their reports. They'll say, oh, I compressed it down to 157. Um, and so the importance of having units or, or converting everything to the same unit. So originally it was actually 21,000 kilobytes, and we've taken it from 21,000 down to 157. How much smaller is that? A heck of a lot smaller. In fact, I'm curious. Down to 157, it's 133 times smaller. Okay, um, because it's silence, 
But if I take that heavy guitar thing and I convert that one down, it goes from 36 megabytes down to 22 megabytes. In other words, it's hardly smaller at all. There's so much um, you know, noise and stuff in there that it has to preserve all of that and, and use a lot of bits to represent that. Now, how that works, again, isn't part of the standard. It's just understanding that some music will be smaller, some will get a lot smaller. Um, some methods, like MP3, will always make things the same size. So I think I've already done it. The silence, um, I just saw my name here. Um, the silence is an, is an M, MP file goes down to 247k. Well, I'll, I'll let you or your students answer this question. You know, does silence compress smaller with MP3, with AAC, with Apple Lossless, or what do you call Org Vobis, or, you know, there's, there's different um, types of um, music compression around, um, but they only need one or two of them to, and, and, and you can see very quickly they start to form a chart, put it in a spreadsheet, draw a graph of, you know, if, if the file is this big, then it ends up that big, and if it's this big, and this kind of music, you know, all my rock collection always seems to compress about 20 times, but my classical collection seems to compress about 30 times, or whatever, and there's so much you can explore, and highly personalised, um, you know, every student can do something completely different, and they've got evidence that they've been through this process, and they've actually had to, you know, look at the size of these files, and if they're accurate about their measurement units, and they distinguish a kilobyte from a megabyte, then they've you know shown that they've got some understanding of what's going on. Yeah. Does the compression ratio ever depend on the size of the file? The, oh, does the, the ratio depend on the size of the file? Um, yes, in short, it can. Um, with these generally, well, well with M MPEG, for example, often you specify what ratio you want when you do the compression, and it will just adjust the quality of the file to, to that ratio, so it, that will always be the same. Now, this is music compression, but there's lots of other compression around. So with, um, uh, the, so zip, or um, just archiving, arg, um, gzip, it's, what, what are the names, but just general purpose uh, compression. Uh, Arc, ta, ta, ra, 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 yeah, okay. So anything where you sort of right click on a file and say, or into one collection, is, is another compression system, yeah? Sorry? Um, yeah. <laughs> Right, so can you right, can you decompress? A, a great question for your students. Yeah. So the answer is yeah. Um, Apple, the, there's two kinds of compression: um, lossless and lossy. Um, and basically, with lossless compression, if you're a bit careful, because this is actually my area of research outside um, <laughs> education, so uh, I can talk all day about it. Um, so. Lossless compression, <coughs> things stay, can, can always be decompressed to exactly how they were before. Lossy, you lose, you give away some quality, so that we, if, you can convert it back to a WAV file um, using these systems, but the WAV file will be the same low quality that your MP3 was, that it had, because you've lost that information. And so lossy stuff, um, MP3, AAC, um, which is also known as MP4 or MP4, um, and also um, JPEG for, for photos. Um, oh, right, so GIF is lossless for images. Um, oh, sorry, no, no, you're right. No, no, GIF is down here. Okay. Um, but ping, portable network graphics, is lossless. Um, TIFF can be either, I think, because um, it's a sort of a general format. But generally, is, is lossless. Uh, with music, uh, well, the classic format is a, is a WAV file, but sometimes it's referred to as an eighth file if you're, especially on Macs a lot. Um, and so, so, so that's, that's images, that's music. Um, for video, uh, video is almost always lossy, really. Um, so we've got MP. Um, and you know, this links to the Wikipedia entry for each of these if you want to know. Again, you don't need to know, but it's interesting to find out. So for example, MP stands for you know, Motion Picture Expert Group. Yeah, Motion Picture Expert Group. Who, uh, it's a group of people from different parts of the industry who got together and agreed on a standard 
Uh, and, and that's used on DVDs and uh, YouTube and all sorts of stuff. Um, or very variants of it. Um, so that the team can play anything on any machine, hopefully, most of the time. Um, there's great crossover here with the media stuff, in particular with keeping your image files at the top at that um, optimal resolution and set and folder before you mess with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then saving as JPEG, you've got that slider of how right, the quality which determines the get the to play with Probably. at which point in the slider do you notice it at this resolution and what you're doing yeah. and then if you're the image for web and stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. I but that's like, you should probably just point out that the ones like Zip and then the lost ones. Oh, thank you. That's a significant point. <laughs> it's the answer to your question, too. So we've got the Zip. Yeah. Um, well, I, uh, um, sometimes it's just called Compress. Like on a Mac, you write to the kind of file and it says Compress. Uh, uh, um, Gzip. Almost anything that you use on a general file is lossless. It's going to reproduce the original. So, and so one of the questions that the students could look into is what happens if I use zip on a WAV file? Because that will work, right? It, it will compress it, but it probably won't work very well because it's not designed for audio. Another thing that surprised me to point out is you can't change one point to the other just by changing the letters. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> At the risk of um, tucking up, Tim, the CS Unplugged article on drawing images demonstrates uh, lossless compression and is really good for the kids and yeah. it helps um, them understand that you can compress things by having a different. Yeah, actually. Um, so there's a new level one unit standard on image representation and image stuff, and it's got all this built in it as well. Um, so there's, there's a great crossover <laughs> between. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, there goes Matt again, right? Oh, um, yes, yeah, just what I remember, um, we've actually got a one-hour show for primary school kids as well, which is on YouTube, if you, if you want to see a whole hour of... So Matt used to run um, these shows for, for kids where we did a lot of these activities, just in one hour. Um, again, you can, if you want to humiliate your fifth form, you can sort of show them 10-year-olds um, answering all these questions correctly and so on. Um, but, yeah, the, so the, the activity basically involves, you know, grids and... Uh, images that the kids can do. The, the video we did of it is actually kept drawing them on the side of the school wall, which, but uh, they're encouraged to do it on paper. Um, so if you go to the unplugged site, I might as well put this out, there's a, it says download activity 2, um, and it's, it's a PDF file that's got <coughs> explanations of it all, um, talks a bit about how to demonstrate it, um, and then it's got a worksheet down here, so these are numbers that represent an image and they can decode what the images are and, for the, and they can write their own images and make up numbers for it and hopefully down here yeah, it's got the solutions for, for teachers too. So those are the actual images that they end up decoding with. Um, yeah, so that's the image one and actually there's another one on there too which um, called text compression um, which uh, you just put the activity. <laughs> yeah, um, that makes more sense when you see this. So, um, all the zip and stuff, if this explains how the zip system works, um, which is just, a re it looks for a pattern in the file that's stored and replaces it with something that says, just, just copy, copy this from there. Um, and it's much quicker to say that. So, there's an example for students to, to try and decode. Um, you know, so it's a bit hard to see. What's that letter there? Mm -hmm. That letter is... Uh, 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 and then this thing here points to something with a whole lot of gaps in, but you've just figured out what those gaps are. So that line there is actually... Peace Porridge. Peace Porridge. And Peace Porridge in there. Uh, yeah. And that basically, by the way, is how, you know, how zip and compress and all those things work. Um, Again, you know, aimed at kind of primary school, but you could probably adapt that fairly easily. Yeah, just picking up on exactly that comment that's aimed at primary school, you know, I'd say you probably tend to use a whole thing after this thing. Yeah. It's not what embarrassing as it is, but <laughs> no, the kids love it. They're very excited. They're taking it home. And I say, take this home, show your kids that you've just losslessly compressed an image. Yeah. Oh. 
I didn't have that. Yeah. Talking about it after school, I come back and say, they did images, can we do images? Why am I having to stuff like that? Which actually makes me think that <coughs> don't not use it because I mean maybe we're looking sometimes in the wrong places yeah. for the resources. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing I've found with this is it's more a matter of attitude than that, because I mean some of the stuff is cute and cuddly for little kids, um, but, and, and it's got cartoons and all that sort of thing in it, but in fact even Arnold goes down well with the older kids, if you don't say, you know, if you're not patronising basically, um, then, yeah. Um, yes? I would say um, animation, you know, earlier on when you put it, would it be okay to use that as a, to, like, to compress and use that as a report, their own animation? As two different types of um, files? Uh, as two types of files. So they've done an animation, then they compress it like as MPEG or something like that. Um, that, would, that would be good. Um, what I think to show an understanding, you wouldn't want to say, I took one file, my file, and made it smaller, and that's how big it is. That's kind of just. Um, what's very convincing is like I took five different types of files, and they all, do, you know, I've, I've started to get a feeling for, oh, the files are always 10 times smaller, or some files get smaller and some don't. Um, and, and so, but having theirs, or, or what would work there is I compressed it using 10 different settings, um, like high quality and low quality and all that, and, and the sizes, it went from 10 times smaller to 100 times smaller, but the one that's 100 times smaller looked absolutely awful. Um, and, and so that, that would demonstrate that they've, they've sort of done a range of stuff. To me, right, I'm not marking the stuff, by the way, but if, if, I, if I did have to mark it, I, I would look at something like that and say, oh, yeah, they clearly understand all the so issues. So it would be more sort of like for a creation school, but run from YouTube, what size that to be that Yeah, stuff? yeah, exactly. Pirating videos is a great <coughs> topic, because they have this DVD is four and a half gigs long, and if you wanted to pirate it and post it on, where's BB, you've got how Okay, so we've done one kind of encoding, compression. Um, oh, just one more thing I'll say about compression. Is, uh, understand that there was a guy in Nelson, and some of you may have heard this, um, who uh, about 10 years ago came up with a compression method that would compress anything to 1 15th of the size and it was lossless. Okay? And New Zealanders put in $5 million of investment into the system. And last year the serious fraud office gave him a free self for of his own actually. Um, because you cannot losslessly compress something 15 times. In fact, you cannot losslessly make something at one bit smaller. Uh, okay. uh, and, and again, your students can try this. Um, sorry, you can make one thing smaller, but any if I give you any files, some have to expand to allow for the ones that are smaller. Um, but getting a feel for compression, and you know, it's like this. For most people who had anything to do with computer science, they go, "This this guy's a fraud." And, and by the way, what he was doing is that he would, um, well, what we think he was doing is that he um, would take the file and hide it somewhere else on the disk, and replace it with a tiny file that pointed to where it was on the disk. And so people would run the program, and the file would go really small and they'd go, wow, that's incredible, but can you get it back? And he goes, sure, run his decompressed program on it, and boof, this big file comes back, and it's exactly the same as the original. And people got their checkbox and gave him $5.3 million. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And really sadly, a lot of them convinced their aunts and uncles and grandmas to get out their checkbooks as well, and those people are down by $5.3 million. Oh. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, this, this stuff isn't just kind of, you know, about MP3s and so on, it's actually, and it's an illustration, the whole computer science thing is actually having a, a feel for what's sensible and what's not, what, what is possible. And, and the trouble is, of course, we keep on seeing stuff that you'd think was impossible, like your entire CD collection in your pocket, right, yeah. um, is possible. So being able to, and again with compression, we can go, oh, okay, yeah, actually that is possible because it just can store this much and MP3 compresses that much, and so, yeah, that would fit. Um, but being able to say, that, yeah, that makes sense and that doesn't make sense is, is really cool. Here I say that for the average teenager, um, that sort of magic of compression and losing some of the um, quality <coughs> they will have down to the mini house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's the difference. Right. Having high and low quality, same as the potentially, but. Oh, uh, I definitely can, yeah. If, 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 
Uh, and, and again, computer scientists, we like extreme, we like boundary cases, right? What's the smallest you can possibly compress it? You just end up with like three pixels moving around on the screen or something like that. But, uh, I mean, most systems won't let you do really bad compression, but um, if you can find a system that'll let you push things way down to the limit, you can end up with some, you know, you, what, does anyone know what heavily compressed music sounds like? It's just like rotting. You know, it's got the noise and the sort of stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, now, the, the error correction thing, so the parity is a good illustration of something that actually happens on computers, but um, another good example is with barcodes and especially ISBN numbers. So some of you may have come across this, um, where the last digit in an ISBN number is actually calculated using all the other digits in the number. Uh, and in fact, the calculation is quite simple. You take the, the digits, 9780 and so on, 9780, you multiply the first one by one, the next by three, the next by one, the next by three, and so on. Yeah. Alternating, yeah. Change your algorithm there from the old one. Yes. If you multiply by nine, what, what happened? It changed so, two years ago. Is it? Yeah. So they've actually. So I, I discovered this in a school to my embarrassment. Oh, yes. no. <laughs> so if you've got a barcode that was an older one, yep. does this one still no. code it? No. Nope. So um, you have to have two alternative attempts. Yeah. No. Nope. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it'll all be in Heidi's document. It'll say, watch out, there are two kinds of barcodes, and uh, here's how to decode one, and here's how to decode the other. Okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, and that's interesting in itself, actually, because the old one could... So, so the idea of this is that you know, if you do all that arithmetic on it, it tells you that the last digit should be a 9. If that 9 was actually typed as an 8, right, then this number would add up to one less, and that number there would end up probably as, a, as an 8 or a 0 instead. And you'd know straight away that someone had typed that, that number or not. Um, and there's an equivalent one for credit cards, um, which, uh, and, and we've got a spreadsheet that we'll put up on the website for this, but again, get your students to write the spreadsheet. But basically, you punch in the numbers, it tells you what the um, check digit should be, and you can compare it with what it actually is for that particular one. And credit cards, the last digit on a credit card is a check digit. Okay, so um, if we weren't running out of time, I would get someone to read out their credit card number to me. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have the option of telling me one digit wrong. And this system, if they tell me a digit wrong, that system will reveal it to me straight away. Which is reassuring because you type your credit card number on a website, and if you get one digit wrong, you're not going to accidentally charge it up to someone else. The website itself can instantly come back and say, oh, you've made a typing mistake. Not even looking it up in a database, um, which makes it much faster. What are we interested in? You know, we want systems that are efficient and fast. They can tell us straight away that this is the algorithm. For credit cards, it's it's all on the on there, but it's it's very similar to this. You just multiply every second digit by a different number. <laughs> um, before Christmas, I think. Oh, good. Is the plan? Yeah. Yeah. You just got to buy more coke for home. Yeah. 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 Speaking of refreshments, I think it's actually morning tea time, so uh, we'll do that and I'll kind of run over time a bit. We'll try and come back there. 11.05. Wow. Okay. In that case, I'll do a credit card number, shall I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That was the um, the last teacher's credit card number. Just need that to be false. Okay. Who wants to read me a possibly false credit card number? Oh, I can read it. Okay. Sorry. Four triple nine. Seven six zero zero. Oh, sorry. Don't block this, John. Uh, hang on a minute. Seven six zero zero. 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 Seven six <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, so we've got 
four triple nine. Double seven, double oh. Uh, zero one eight nine. Zero one eight nine. Uh. <laughs> Interface eight. So if, if that adds up to zero, then it's correct. So something you, you typed it in wrong. You gave it to me wrong. It was the last digit should be a one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Tense yeah. moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then no, the number on the back. Um, <laughs> so, in actual fact, it's, it's not that sensitive information because people, you know, have to put it all over the place. It's easy to get credit card numbers. But the um, yeah, the fact that that's a zero tells me that yes, that is a valid credit card number. Now, the, the questions that you might get students to ask, and again, you know, this is personalised. Um, but the, one of the things you do is say, just make up a number and try and have it so that it adds up to zero. Okay. And so credit card generate, number generators actually do this, which are fortunate systems, but we just ask the students to do it. So if she type... <laughs> Does it work with these cost numbers? Um, oh, so the algorithm, by the way, is multiply that by two, that by one, that by two, by one, you know, so just alternating there. And, and when they're multiplied, if it's a double digit number, add those two digits together. So it's a 14 at the list of five. Add those up and it should basically be a multiple of 10. Can you show us the, um, the formula? Add a double digit. That's how I do it, anyway. Um, so if it's more than 9, it's a double digit. Uh, then it's the number divided by 10 plus modulo that number 10. Oh, we are going to be giving yeah. this. Oh, oh, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, yeah, sorry. We'll, we'll put this online anyway. Again, you wouldn't give it to your students, right? You'd ask them to actually figure out how to do it, probably. Especially learning spreadsheets. But, great programming exercise too. They can write a program that you type a credit card number into. It picks out each of the... Um, in fact, it's sort of a bit like the hangman, isn't it? You know, pick out each character and work out what to do with it. Do it. Every alternating one has to be dealt with differently and so on. And that's got all the ingredients for a meaningful exercise. Um, and very easy to personalise because you just get your parents' credit card number and put it in or, or, or make up one, you know. So, so the question is, what if she had changed a digit but this actually still came up as a zero. How can we make that happen? So, if I, if I change that four to a, uh, actually no, I won't change that one. Um, if I change that nine to an eight, then you know the sum is out by one. Okay, it's now a nine instead of a well, seventy-nine instead of eighty. Um, change the seven to an eight. Down, down, down. Down, down, down. Next one. Not that one. To an eight. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put you out of your misery. There is no change you can make that will actually give you a zero at the end. Yeah, you can, you, there's easily two changes you can make, right? You know, push one up and one down, and they'll compensate for each other. But if any one digit is wrong, this will detect it. Now, again, don't tell your students, but have them experiment with it, and they will soon find out that, to their frustration, it looks like there must be some way of making that work, but in fact, there is no way. Trivial kind of algorithm, really, right? Just add up a bunch of numbers. Uh, not too hard to understand, not too hard to write in a spreadsheet, and yet you've got something that will detect any typing error if that error is getting one of the digits wrong. Another com the most, next most common typing error, about getting one digit wrong? Switching, around. Switching two around. So if we had 9, 4 and instead of 4, 9 at the beginning, then again, the number's wrong because every alternating weight is different. And so it's almost impossible to swap two digits and not have that checksum detected. Okay? Um, so to stuff it up, you really have to make two mistakes. Uh, and, and that's error detection. The same with the parity game, right? If, if there's one mistake, um, Heidi can always figure out which one that was. If there were two mistakes, you know there's a mistake, but you can't fix it. Um, and if there's more than two, then possibly they can actually counteract each other. And you may end up not even noticing that something's gone wrong. Now, again, it's not that students need to go and check credit cards or anything like that, but just to expose them to the idea that we could actually know that a number is right or wrong without even looking it up in a database or something like that is, is quite powerful. And it's um, just, remember, the big, big picture of this is for them to realize that this thing called computer science exists where they worry about making things fast and efficient and reliable, and suddenly this thing here actually does make it faster and more reliable. Um, and so when you do internet banking off the trade me and you go and type in someone's bank account number, it's got a check sum in it. Uh, and that means that if, if you make one mistake, chances are it'll pick it up, it won't go and put the money into someone else's account, which is quite interesting. Students in this end, 
ministry numbers? Oh, okay. I don't know. The ministry numbers, have they got a check sign? The, the place you really notice this is if, if two or three people all apply in a row, and the second to last digit of their, their number is going one, two, three, four, five, and the last digit is random, um, so you know that they're in sequence. So someone mentioned in one of these that they, they went and got IRD numbers for their kids, and, and the kids, you know, the IRD numbers were all in sequence except the last digit was random, and so you know that the last digit is, is random. Yeah. There's no particular reason people wouldn't publish this information, but you know, it's... Um, so you can find it. It's all over the place. Um, basically, anywhere that people want to be able to check things. Some trains in Germany, the, yeah, only the Germans who do it, the last digit of the number of a train is a check sign. So if, if someone says train number 5223, turn left, and they go, there is no train number 5223 because the three is a check sign and you've got it wrong, one of those digits, uh, then it's a sa another safety measure. Um, you can use it for data entry too. So if you've got a whole pile of um, exams and you're putting those numbers into a spreadsheet, just quickly add up everyone's marks, the total of the marks. So it's called a hash total, it's a meaningless total, but then you type it in the spreadsheet and work out the total of that. And if those two totals are the same, chances are you've entered all the numbers right, or else you've added one to one student and subtracted one from the other student, which is pretty unlikely that you've compensated exactly, you know, by making two mistakes. Um, so these are all things that assure us that, that we've got accurate data that, uh, that things are going on. It's only as good as the system. I have a story where at a university that made names, but not this one. Um, yeah. A student needed to get photocopying credit and was asked for a credit card number, put in four sets of zeros, and was granted as much credit as he wanted. He managed to do this three times before he was asked to attend to a uh, uh, you know, of B to explain his actions. So somewhere in there. Yeah, and often these kind of systems do sort of, um, you know, that's a boundary condition, right, that someone had thought of, or it's, you know, some test case that someone put in and forgot to take it out. Um, just making people sensitive to these extremes is, is really good. So um, we, we've got links to all these kind of, so there's a site called Illumination, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, uh, is one place that explains credit card numbers. Um, the, the name of that particular algorithm, by the way, is called the Loon algorithm. It's a bit like the Loon, that's where you multiply by one and two and one and two and so on. But there's, there's all sorts of variants around. Okay, so we've done um, coding for compression and coding for error correction. Um, the last one, uh, and I'm skipping heaps of really cool stuff, which is good because if we do this again next year, hopefully then uh, I can give you more cool stuff. But the, the last one is for encryption. Um, and we've had some sort of endless discussions about the best way to teach this, but I think one of the easiest ways is to actually use a method that no one would ever use on a digital system. Um, it's a little bit like teaching those five-bit um, codes or, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that students are going to be looking at are sort of toy systems that you wouldn't actually use in practice, but they, they, they do expose all the ideas. So you kind of want them to look at the toy system to understand the concept, and then to go and look at real systems and see those concepts that work. So with security, um, the, the big place that lots of people use it would be internet banking, or any time that an S comes up after your HTTP, okay, so the S is secure, so HTTPS, there's some kind of um, secure system, some encryption going on so that people can't sort of wiretap your internet banking and see what's going on. So that's, but to understand how that system works requires some fairly advanced mathematics, but the Caesar cipher, which is very widely used, um, and some related ones called substitution ciphers, where you just substitute one letter for another, um, will, can illustrate a lot of the points. So here's a Caesar cipher, and, and our suggestion is that you actually just give your students a code like this. And there are websites where you can just type in sentences and things, and it'll give you the, the code of text. So the way the Caesar cipher works, again, very ancient code, you can tell by the name. Um, traditionally, you take each letter and you just add three to that letter. So A would be B, C, D, um, B, E, F, G, and so on. B, C, D, e. So if you've got a B, you change it to an E. If you've got a C, change it to an E. Trivial to try and crack that kind of cipher, but um, this one, instead of using three, this one's used some other value that will be not set by a certain amount. How are you going to crack this? Yes? Look for a common... Look for a common... 
Yeah. So the two whites together probably represents two molecules. Mm. The apostrophe V V makes it V look like an L. Okay, the K is probably going to be an I because it appears on its own. It's an I or an A. Right. So, so that's good. Um, the kind of attack that you're doing there um, is it's basically um, using knowledge of the text. Okay. Um, it's uh, and doing an analysis of the text. And again, that's one way of attacking. Now, the terminology we've already used a bit of a terminology here. So it's an encrypted text. Um, and in my big words handout, so it's called the cipher text. Okay? So what I've shown is the cipher text, but what you're trying to figure out is called the plain text. These are words that cryptographers use just to be very precise about which thing they're talking about. Okay? Um, the, the number, how much that offset is instead of three or whatever, is the key. It's what unlocks the cipher text. And so you're trying to figure out the key by doing an attack on the cipher text. And attack is the word that we use for trying to, to decode it. Some of you use fairly graphical phrases. Yeah. Can you crack that up for the attack? Yes, yeah, so there's two or three websites actually um, where students can actually go and try and crack stuff. Oops. Get my head. Um, so here's another one, cryptograms.org. Um, and, and so that they've got well, it's got ideas for how to do it, and it's got examples of things to try and crack it. I think the um, NSA to in America have got it one as well for kids, so that you know they're easy enough to, to attack. So there's lots of sites they can go to. Again, dead easy to personalise. You know, my teacher gave me this text, or um, I went to my friend. You know, we went in pairs, and my friend gave me a text, and I managed to crack. You know, first of all, I tried looking for common letters, and then I tried um, another, another kind of attack is actually just. What's the most frequent letter? So, what, what's the most frequent letter in English? E. e, usually. Okay, if it's English, which we assume. And so, what's the most frequent letter in here? And you know, you can just do the statistics. Great computer programming exercise, right? Read that whole thing and produce a table something like that that you know says there's 29 spaces and in fact the letter O is and is the, says 16 of those and 14 K. So probably O or K is the one representing the letters E and T. Okay. And so now we've, we've got what's called a statistical attack. So now we've, um, so we've, we've got plain text, cipher text, we've done an attack. We've, um, a known plain text attack is where you know, somehow you actually know what it should decode to and you can work out the key. And that's not that unusual because you can actually sometimes feed something into a system uh, and have it come through. The, I mean the Enigma code was famous for this because the Germans um, quite often put um, in their messages, what, what they always put in a message to help the allies decode them. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so you know that it's in there somewhere, and so that's a known plain text attack. You know what you're looking for, and once you decode the Heil Hitler part, that gives you the key, and you can use it to decode the rest of it, which is uh, one flaw in their system. Um, but, uh, and then a brute force attack, you just try out every possible key. So is it one? Is it offset by two? Is it offset by three? And again, if, if with the Caesar cipher, there's only 25 <coughs> possible keys. So you could write a program that prints out all 25 offsets. Great programming exercise. It's got loops, it's got boundaries, it's got all that sort of stuff. And it will print out 24 piles of garbage, and one of them will be plain text. But then, it, then we go over to the bits, and we say, well, if instead of 26 keys or 25 keys possible, what if there were an 8-bit key, 256 possible keys? What if there was a 16-bit key? How many would you have to print out? And these students have actually been doing a brute force attack, and they realize that actually brute force on, say, 64-bit keys, how long would it take? At a million a second, well, what's, you know, how many possible 64-bit keys are there? Billions and billions, divide that by a million a second, and you might be talking about, I don't know, five years, 500 years, something like that. And, and suddenly it becomes obvious that attacking this is gonna take time. And if we go to 200 bits, um, they can work it out. Quite often it works out to things like you know, 25 billion centuries or something like that. And, and you know that, so, so it can be cracked, but it just, no one's going to be interested by the time you've cracked it, right? Uh, and, and 25 billion centuries, well, what if you're a, a government that has a billion computers all trying out different keys at the same time and can go a billion times faster, how long is it going to take? Instead of 25 billion centuries, it's going to be a billion times faster, so it's going to take 25 centuries. So you still feel secure. 
Yeah. So, and, and, and so that's, that's the kind of reasoning that can be done. And using a method that is completely done, okay? So, so you know, the, um, and, and there's, there's some other ciphers and there's substitution ones where you don't offset everything by the same amount, but you just, you know, you randomize it. So um, what, what letter are you going to substitute for another one? Most of the kids' ciphers that you see in books and so on tend to be substitution ones, but sometimes they just use, instead of letters, they might use um, you know, funny symbols and things like that to substitute. The other common thing in ciphers is transposition, so swapping, um, like group them in fives and reverse them, something like that, and then combine that, group them in fives, reverse them, and then substitute. Uh, still, you know, will a statistical attack work on that? Yes, because the statistics are the same. Uh, will a brute force attack work? Well, not really because you've got the reversal, but it would if you try out every possible substitution and every possible reversal, but how many of those are there? Way too many. <laughs> if we just take what we've covered now back to the standards, mm -hmm. um, what sort of attack there, say for encryption, it actually says OR encryption, doesn't it? So yes. For an excellence, it's only one of these, compression yeah. coding, error control, OR encryption. Yeah. So we do a little like, demonstrate what you know about encryption. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> the, the way that we're reading this is um, that the students would touch on each of those. I mean, in one hour, I think, you've actually done all three methods and probably got a feel for them, right? Um, and then they would probably pick one that they're particularly interested in and, and do a real project on it. But maybe do a little introductory thing on, on all three. So for achieve they need all three, for merit they need all three, and then for actions they need one. Dig, dig deep into one of them. I think it's achieve they need all three and merit and excellence they need one. So I think merit's just one. But I, I one or more of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well that's still it's Yeah, one or more. So, so it's really can be more than one. Um, so excellence, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, what's the wording? Is the wording for excellence just Evaluation. Just all one. Yeah. And so if we go back to the types of data, mm. compare and contrast different ways in which different types of data can be represented using bits. Yeah. So different types of data. So um, for text, what are the different ways of representing data using bits? You know, Unicode, ASCII, UTF. That's, and Tim's done a five bit code, right? You know, that's examples. Of, now, how would you compare them? What's the difference? Well, one uses, you know, they each use different numbers of bits. What advantage does that give you? What's the advantage of using my five-bit system over an eight-bit system? Yeah, it's sort of, you get shorter songs. Um, what, what's the advantage of an eight-bit system over a five-bit system? Yeah. yeah, you've got lowercase characters as well as uppercase and punctuation and things like that. What's the advantage of 16 bits? Well, you've got thousands of Chinese characters. And so that's the kind of comparison. But to personalize that comparison, for example, my Chinese friend's name is written as such and such um, in Unicode, which is the numbers, you know, 2,000, 5,000, whatever. Um, and I mean, from that point of view, I just encourage the students to always put in something that is clearly random or unique to them. Um, you know, the code that I was given, the, my favorite files in this. <coughs> so evaluating a widely used system for compression coding, error control coding, and encryption. Yep. So would you be expecting people to <coughs> talk about um, well, the disks, what's the RAID 5? You could, yeah. Or what, what you, are we yeah. talking about? Widely used error control code. Would we talk about a Visa card number? Yeah, a Visa card number is a widely used error control mm -hmm. coding system. So, so a whole study on Visa cards, on credit cards, would be great. It would, it would evaluate it. It would say, oh, and, and the evaluation is, how good is it? Well, there is no single digit I can change that it won't detect. That's, that's an evaluation of how good it is. Um, there is no pair of digits in my mum's credit card number that I can swap that it won't detect. And there's only 15 swaps you can do. So you can actually, you know, sort of list them all or go through them all and show that, that they're all detected. And, and, and you know, if you hadn't heard of the system before, which perhaps some of you hadn't, and you saw a student had written, I swapped every pair of my, and, and, and every single swap was detected, that's a very convincing evaluation that, man, this, this actually is on thing, it's onto something. Yeah, yeah. Um, really good question, thanks, Max, actually, just bring us back to you know, what we'd actually do. Um, was there anything else in there that we could? Um, well, there's the human control interface, the other one. Yeah. No, I think that's, that's 
different types of data represented as inputs. Compare and contrast, and then evaluate it seems to be the step up. Right. No? Um, discussing how a widely used technology is enabled by one or more of. Oh, yeah. Technology. So, widely te used technology is enabled by encryption or whatever. So, what's a widely used technology? Yes, well, like the iTunes thing. Uh, yeah, so, but, and what's the, what, what's the technology? Well, it's probably MP3 players or iPods or something. So, you know, how, what would an iPod look like if we couldn't compress things down to a tenth of the size or a twentieth of the size? What, would it either be ten times as big to store the same amount of data, or it would only store a tenth of the files? And so it's enabled by the fact that we can do the compression. Um, cameras, oh, well, I didn't talk about images, but the, um, the lossless equivalent for images um, is uh, on Windows a bitmap file typically, um, and on cameras it's often referred to as a raw file. Um, and how, I don't even know how much bigger is a raw file than a, than a JPEG typically. Twice as big. Well, I'm like here for the routine. So the X10 megabytes. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so maybe three or four times as big or something. But again, that's the question the student can ask, especially if they're a photography fanatic. You know, do a whole lot of war files. Do a war. So, what are, what, are, what are the boundary cases? What's an extreme image that you'd want to see how big it is on a war file compared with a JPEG? Solid black. Solid black, yeah. Um, how do you get a solid black image, actually, is one challenge. Yeah. So, you could certainly do this part of the standard in your web development, too, in the media course, couldn't you? Because you could look at it. Encryption and HTTPS, you can look at file sizes and compression to make the pages go faster. Yeah. And, yeah, and then that's where some of this really counts, is again with efficiency and speed. If you put up your raw photo of 10 megabytes, then it, you know the, the page is just going to dribble down. And even if you put up a full JPEG, it's going to come through. And you see all the time, let's put it at 200, and that's a picture that yeah. is going to last for ages. And, and again, that's so, you know, saying I reduced it to this many bytes, um, the quality's down a bit, but it's it's this much smaller, it's going to load this much faster. You know, if the person's using it on a smartphone that's connected to the internet at this many bits every second, it'll take this many seconds to load. That, that's demonstrating a really solid understanding of what these bits and representations and compression mean. So a widely used system for encryption would we be looking at the encryption and stuff like that yep. there, or would we be looking at a Caesar cipher? Um, no, well, wide, a widely used one for encryption, so it, it's a little harder, but uh, PG, PGP is a good one. Um, so, Wi-Fi? Sorry? What about Wi yeah, Wi-Fi connections would be another good one too. Um, so, uh, WEP and WAP and... So we could have the basic Wi-Fi one. <laughs> yeah. um, because some, some Wi-Fi um, uh, connections uh, are known to be insecure, right? And, and, and so, what's the difference between them, and, and where is that insecurity? And that's well documented, you know, there'd be heaps of people who have written about why you should never use this protocol or these settings or, or whatever, and it's, it, it's all going to be to do with the kind of attacks that are possible on it. And suddenly your students will be talking, of, you know, they'll, they'll be reporting back, well, my school system uses this, it's not it's vulnerable to attack because you can do this and that or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean the, the security ones are a little hard to do, and it's, some of these things you've got to be a little careful too. Um, someone who can name themselves if they want, we're going to look at the interface of um, a um, FPOS machine, which is very cool because people struggle with FPOS machines, right? I mean, who swipes the card the right way first time? Um, and what's what's the HCI rule about that would help people to swipe cards the right way all the time? Consistency, yeah, because some it's on the right and some it's on the left, and Without consistency, people get it wrong. Um, and why not put on both sides? Exactly, that's, that's sort of a good, good solution. It works either way. Um, rather than telling you you're wrong, just just says, oh, okay, you're going to do it that way. Fine. Um, so, but but the thing is, if, if if you bring in 20 kids to photograph and zap and swipe headpost machines or ATMs or something like that, you'll probably get some attention pretty quickly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and likewise, if you're doing the school Wi-Fi and you're saying. This, this method will actually break the school Wi-Fi, or that method will break it. It's probably, you want to be talking to your Wi-Fi person first before you start doing that. Okay. So um, for the encryption then, could you link it into your MySQL and your password, uh, and do password hashing and yep. dictionary attacks? You could 
you, you, if, if, if you're into password, if you know what password hashing is and all that sort of stuff, by all means. And actually, it's, it's a very cool idea that comes from the error correction stuff. Um, I think I'll mention this. So, you know, I, I talk about hashing where you just take a whole lot of values and just add them together and multiply by a bunch of numbers and things like that, and you end up with a value. A lot of passwords are stored that way. So you enter your password, and they just add up all the characters in the password and multiply them by numbers and whatever. And, and store that, that final value. And the way that they can verify your password is you type the password in again and do all the hashing on it. And if it hashes to the same value, then it's probably the same password. But if someone hacks in and gets all the, those files, none of them actually show the passwords. So with, you know, if your password's stored securely, it's not actually even stored. Um, you know, it's again quite a powerful concept. Um, any one of those things would be fine for excellence. And, and with most of the stuff, too, I just encourage people to go off the things that they feel most confident with. Um, yeah. I think it's more interesting something like that. You were going to end up with a whole class looking at the same stuff. Aren't you? So, you know, it would be making it individual. Making it individual, but then your choice of key in an encryption system, your choice of, you know, um, Encryption may be a little harder, but, but you can demonstrate things using a Caesar cipher with different texts and you know, get a text from a friend and try and decrypt that and so on. And you're showing an understanding of concepts by attacking something in different ways. Everybody's going to take it home and get the neighbours' wives. <laughs> and yeah. the That's highly personalised, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How many attempts to take that to break? Stop recording. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we'll have more tea. <laughs>